Well, I guess I should say good morning, Craig. Good morning, sir. We are recording this on a Saturday, I guess, uh, outside of our normal routines. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Through a Therapist Eyes. We're going to talk about substance abuse today and get into what I call the disease model, what I don't call, but it's called the disease model, and and everything substance abuse. We haven't done anything substance abuse yet, and uh, I just figured we need to break into it. So how are you? I'm doing great, man. had a little cold over the week, and that's why we're recording on on a Saturday, but I think my voice is back now and should be should be good to go. I know it's funny. You were all froggy and said you've lost your voice, and I went and had breakfast with my mom this morning, and hello, mom, by the way, and uh, I'm sitting here on a Saturday, and my clinical brain is turned off. Well, it's time to turn that sucker <laughs> back on, man. It's off, man. I go home on Fridays, and uh, I turn it off and, and try to keep it completely off for the weekend. It's just what I do for you know, my own self-care. So it's, it's really weird to talk about therapy stuff on a Saturday you gotta, morning. You got to fire it up, man. Get, get, <laughs> with a, get with a, a character. With a full stomach of breakfast, man. This is, this is going to be tough. So welcome to Through a Therapist Eyes, the podcast, where we invite you through to see the world through the lens of a real mental health and substance abuse therapist with the goal to create emotional growth. Uh, this is not a delivery of a therapy service in any way, and we are looking for feedback and discussion. Uh, it's very much welcomed and sought through the website through a therapist eyes.com using the blog tab. I think we've got some comments actually we started to do. That was exciting. We do, we do. And I just want to throw this out there. A lot of folks may or may not want to comment on, on mental health issues in a public format. Um, on the blog, I think you can post anonymously, but if you have questions or comments, you can always send us t- send those to us through messenger facebook messenger that's little strictly, blue lightning bolt strictly button. private yeah and would never chris obviously there's uh, ethics and things like that with therapy never reveal anybody's name if uh if, if that was asked if it was asked in confidential uh, by confidential means absolutely correct absolutely correct the human emotional experience let's figure this thing out together Let's figure this thing out together. But before we do, let's start by mentioning our sponsor on today's podcast, Metrolina Psychotherapy Associates, the psychotherapy agency located in Belmont, North Carolina, serving children, adolescents, adults, and couples. Metrolina was founded in July of 2010 by our own Chris Gaznick, and the agency strives to work with you towards emotional growth. You can find more information about MetPsych at metpsych.com and or call 704-461-8253. Yes, substance abuse, addiction, alcoholism, drug addiction, uh, you know, abuse of a substance. There's so many phrases and ways that we refer to this thing, and I uh, really hope that we can kind of condense a little bit and get some, some awareness out about a, a huge topic that, I feel like over the years has been, uh, I'm going to say wildly, wildly misunderstood in, in, a, in a lot of ways. And that is in the general public as well as it is in my profession. Yes, I am going to make sort of an opinion statement about how we see this in my profession even. Um. So before I do, I'd kind of like to see your brain, Craig, in, in, in sort of a, a basic way, these topics that we've got. You know, I've thought about you too, man. You're going to be, you keep doing this, man. You're going you're gonna to be a bona fide expert in short order on a lot of therapy topics, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning as we go, for sure. Y- you there's know, a I, lot, there's a lot, a lot of uh, learning going on in my, in my mind. Yes. And, and you do learn when you have focus on something, and you're like hitting this every week. Yeah, it's interesting to me that some of the things we've talked about are, are things that I do have a little bit of knowledge on, like with the CBT, sure. you know, being Eastern and stuff like that, and mindfulness and, and some of those other things. So it's been a good experience, and you're in, we don't get together and, and talk about these things before the show. Purposefully. So I, I learn a lot just on the show, and uh, you know, some things you said with that intro have got my interest peaked about misunderstanding substance abuse and things like that. So I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be really interesting, and I, I purposely kind of have that in my brain because I really like your genuine reaction to stuff, and you're right. We don't talk a lot. I mean, we talk about a lot of things over the time that I've gotten to know you, but 
I, I, and I'm going to do it again. I mean, you've just seen a pattern in our shows where I've kind of started out asking you, what are your thoughts about this? So addiction, substance abuse, yeah, a lot of phrases I just threw out there. How do you see all of this? What is substance abuse? What is well, addiction? You know, substance abuse to me and addiction is you know, it's when people become, I guess, physically dependent upon drugs or alcohol as part of their daily routine. You know, um, and just let me say that I've never had issues with substance abuse, but I do know a lot of people that have had issues with, with that. I, I sat in on a jury one time where I, I was actually had jury duty. Oh. And, um, the young man that was on trial was accused of trafficking cocaine and possession of a firearm or something like that. There is some serious stuff that goes on with, with uh, all of the trafficking really right here in our little hometown. Right here in town, yeah. I mean, trunks full of stuff that would blow your mind. Oh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. One of the questions they asked the fella, or they asked the jury, the jury pool, and I didn't have to go up, and they, they chose the, the jury before I had to go up there and, and uh, answer questions. But one of the questions they asked was, do you know someone who has been directly affected by drug addiction? And, and dude, I counted over 20, over 20 people that I know personally who've had addiction issues or, or struggle with addiction, and that was just off the top of my head, you know, so... You know, I've seen what drug addiction does, and, and I don't want to give too many examples of, of, of situations that I've seen on this podcast. And we podcast want to respect because, their privacy. Yeah, because per, people, personal. I may give an example of somebody who knows me and may be listening, so I'm, I'm not going to do that. But I have seen what, what addiction can do to not only the person, but to their family and their friends as a result of their, of their problem. And it is, we well know, an entire family issue. Uh, there's a whole lot of information that we have out of that about that since the 1970s, uh, 60s, really, as it as it relates. So, which is a good transition. A lot of what my training is based in uh, is from what is called the Minnesota model. Uh, more on that in a second. I kind of lucked out in that my first gig as a anything therapist world was teaching a DUI class and it was up in West Virginia for DUI offenders that were trying to get their license back. And I just took over this little 18 hour education course. And it, I mean, teaching that thing over and over and over again, really solidified the basics of understanding of addiction at the time that we had through that education. And, and if I had not had that I would have fallen into a trap that you're going to hear me talk about in our field that I think people are in where they don't know about alcoholism or drug addiction or substance abuse. We're not, we're not automatically trained with this stuff. I kind of lucked into it, and I'm really, really glad that I did right from the get-go. And that was, that was really, really crucial for me and sort of lucky for me uh, when I was a young green clinician. So the Minnesota model is what I want to highlight right here from the get-go because it, it, it's, it's a foundation that has been kind of supported by science, I would say, and somewhat uh, uh, science has kind of gone against it a little bit. And I, that's a really confusing thing that I want to kind of clear up a little bit. And in our dialogue, I think that we'll be able to do that. But the Minnesota model started in, 19, in the 1950s in a state mental hospital by two young men, one who was to become a psychologist, the other who was to become a psychiatrist, neither of whom had prior experience treating addicts or alcoholics. That comes from, uh, what is this, NCBI, we'll have show notes, kind of gives proper credit and whatnot, but their abstract of an article they wrote is what I'm going by. And interestingly enough, they point out how this thing spread to a small non for profit organization their model of addiction, you'll recognize, spread very quickly to a place called Hazleton. You ever hear of Hazleton? I don't think so. Really? The Hazleton Foundation is a huge, well-known agency now, that, well, foundation that, that is, a, is a really strong leading authority on addiction issues. Uh, and then it spread uh, very quickly throughout the country. Uh, it, the Minnesota model really interestingly blended... Uh, uh, professional and trained non-professional recovering staff around the principles of a, a program that I'm sure you've heard about, Alcoholics Anonymous. Yes. Okay. 
uh, they have a strong participation in Alcoholics Anonymous and their model. And it's called the disease model because it is clearly believed by many, many, many in the field that biological addiction is had at birth. So babies are either an alcoholic or not. That's the fundamental disease model foundation. And so from that, we derive the goal, the only safe goal that we know with addiction is abstinence. You cannot use mind and mood altering substances when you have addiction. And, and that's an important point to kind of understand that a lot of people get very confused about. Because if you don't have addiction, you move your behavior into controlled use. But for an alcoholic with a Minnesota model, which I am really heavily based in and believe in, you, you find that you, 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 you could try abstinence, but it doesn't work. And there's, there's a fundamental difference with substance abuse, which is the term that we use. You can abuse a substance and not have addiction. Prior right. shows, we talked about, you know, self-soothing in destructive ways, buying stuff, you know, being sexual and all yeah. of that. Well, uh, you know, substances are a big piece of that. Yeah, so let me, let me stop you there. So you're saying that this model says that people are born addicts. I- essentially. Okay. I-, I put it that way to help people understand the, the true genetic biological markers that many believe are the basis of why people have the crazy behavior that they have with drugs and alcohol. Right, right. Okay. That's interesting because there's a couple things I would point out there. You know, I'm, I'm, like I know people who are, uh, let's, let's use alcohol. As an example, I went to college, you know, and so, you know, we partied in college and that kind of deal. Right. And so, I, you know, there are people who can, like you said, have a, you know, you might abuse alcohol on a Friday or a Saturday night, but then carry on a normal life after that. Whereas Absolutely. I've seen other guys who can't have one, one drink. They have, you know, if they, if they go one, it's all out. It, it's on or off. Yeah. So there's a definite distinction there between the guy who, who's, an, who's addicted to alcohol versus who's not. Maybe not how they handle themselves on a particular night, but over an extended period of time. Correct. Right? Does that Correct. make sense? It's, it's almost, I can't speak intelligently about it, but, but man, it, there's almost a different biological process that, that people have in breaking alcohol down. And I haven't heard a whole lot of that over the years. And it might be just because I've, I've, I've been very clear in my brain. So I'd be curious what current biological digestive research would say about things but in one conference early on in my career i really remember them talking about how in a in a typical situation you ingest a beer and 100 percent of it is eliminated through various ways of your body right the alcoholic has the same process however 99.7 percent of it is eliminated and the other percentage they broke down it, it, it's not being eliminated right that, that's interesting so let me ask you this though you know, I, uh, there, there are certain, like alcohol, for example, you know, people, I, people can drink on a Friday night and then clean up on Sunday, you know, go to church, whatever they do. Yeah. And then, and then be fine through the week. Sure. But I don't know anybody who's shooting heroin or smoking crack on a Saturday night who's not addicted, you know. So is it, is it also dependent upon the Drug chemical, of choice. The, the You're talking of choice? about drug yeah. of choice. No. Interesting. You know, the reality is a lot of times when you get into the different drugs, you know, cocaine and crack and heroin and pills and people that do huffing, they'll breathe in uh, paint fumes. And I mean, there's so many things, there's so many drugs of choice that are out there that people are using. And somebody who has addiction that you'd never know they were shooting up at lunch. I mean, you know, in, in trainings, we've talked about how there's, there's a, you know, dentists, are, are there with their masks and they have a, a cotton swab in their mask, you know, just sort of getting high all day. Interesting. You, and you'd never know it. Right, right. Listen, I know of a person in my field who was now recovered, but when, when, he was, when he was in active addiction, oh man, he'd sit there in his therapy office drinking Gatorade and vodka all day. Wow. Like, you, the, the behavior you would, and you'd never know this, Craig. There, they, there is such a, a hidden life that is led when you're dealing with active addictions, and they can p- appear, I hate the term, functional alcoholic, 
because they look very functional. And this is a large swath of our society. They're very, very well upstanding citizens in our, in our circles that you'd never know. I mean, and now we have so much more awareness out about this. I mean, you got the Betty Ford Clinic. She is the first lady who had alcoholism. Yeah. And the examples go on and on and on and on. So you're saying that it's not dependent upon drug of choice, it, that you know, a person could dabble in harder drugs and then, like we're talking about with alcohol, go on and lead a normal life through the week? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And I'm even going so further to say that people can use the harder drugs and live a normal life through the week. Huh. Right? You wouldn't know it. Yeah, and that's, that, that's not been my experience with with people you know i've known i had a friend who uh you know we we had well i'm not going to say anybody's name but we had you know he was one of the guys we used to have a good time on the weekends you know and 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 and, but then later in life after we'd kind of gone our separate ways you know he started dabbling in some of the harder stuff and he ended up becoming this guy we're talking about, where he used more frequently. And, and you're it ended pointing up costing out him a lot. I'm you're pointing out that. something uh, that's called progression. So in the early stages of the disease model, this is the way we talk about it. You have mild use. It's not very per- pervasive. It's 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 something that starts small and just like a snowball at the top of the hill. No, I'm from West Virginia, so some people in Florida or Texas or good old North Carolina might not understand the, the, the thickness that snow creates when it's wet. Right. Every rotation rolling down the hill, it gets larger and larger and larger, and it doesn't roll uphill. That's called progression. So this guy, you know, starts out being, you know, one of the guys and hanging out, partying, goofing off and all this, a little bit irresponsible, but you wouldn't really see it until 10 years of progression, and he's a mess. Yeah. And they say that this ends in jails, institutions, or death. I can tell you right now we're going to have to have more you know, episodes on substance abuse being 15 minutes into our show right yeah, now. Yeah, there's so can, much that yeah, I want to say, and we yeah, haven't and gotten you to it. Reference having a guest on, you know, we may do that at some point. And even, and even people who specialize in substance abuse therapy have offered to come on the show too. So yeah, I see this as an ongoing topic. There's a big divergence that I definitely wanted to point out that I've, I, I kind of alluded to before. <laughs> substance abuse in the therapy world is treated in completely different worlds. And I have said for a long time, I'm going to be a little controversial and state an opinion here. And I feel very comfortable doing it because it's been a pet peeve of mine for a long time and it drives me nuts. There is a big, used to be bigger, I do see that it is decreasing, but a big separation between substance abuse professionals and mental health professionals. So counselors do counseling. They talk to you about your depression and your bipolar and your schizophrenia and your anxieties and everything, but they don't talk about substance abuse. Substance abuse people will talk about your addiction, work with recovery, work with relapse triggers and all these different things with rehab and sobriety and all, but they don't talk to you about depression and whatnot. And when I started this field, it was like completely two different worlds. And it drove me absolute nuts. Nuts. Because it, it, it's like you go to your your family doctor and you know they'll talk to you about your blood pressure but they won't talk to you about your headaches how that has got to stop and good news in very recent tone i am starting to hear meaning in this last year maybe the last couple of years of my practice i've begun to see that beginning to shift so that when you're a mental health counselor you're kind of considering substance abuse issues okay but I almost feel like substance abuse has their own board to be licensed to do substance abuse therapy. I, there should be like a mental health board. I, I don't know why we have such a divergence in our field. And I want people to be very careful about that and very aware of that because if you have a family member that has addiction and or your, your, your um, problems, by the way, with addiction, there's process, three process addictions, eating addictions, gambling addictions, and sex addictions. Mm-hmm. Let's just pause on that because I want to note that. Okay, so there's different levels of addiction. Not different levels. There's different drugs of choice. Different drugs of choice. Alcohol and drug addictions. And then you have three process addictions, gambling, food addictions, and sex addictions. Okay. Okay. So, but if you have a family member that's struggling with any one of those four, and you go to a mental health counselor for your, their depression, and they're asking you about their family, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to say that a lot of people have no knowledge or 
very limited knowledge about a major area of your life, a family member with addiction. And I see that as a problem. Mm -hmm. I see that as a problem that is getting better. But I, I have I wanted to use this platform to really highlight we need to get a lot better with that and continue growth as a field to where we have them blended because they really inter intermingle. Mm -hmm. Part of what got me excited recently, I heard Claudia Black on a, on a podcast I was listening to not too long ago, actually last weekend. And she, she actually mentioned that. She's like, I started out doing substance abuse and rehab units, and that's all I did, you know, working with families and stuff. But she's finding more and more. You cannot do substance abuse therapy without running into depression, clinical depression, which is a totally different thing. And she's a, she's a super leading authority on, on substance abuse issues, 30-plus years' experience, particularly with families. It was really refreshing to hear her highlight that. So that's uh, enough of that, but, uh, but I, I really wanted to point that out so people can understand what you're dealing with in the field and when you're looking for a therapist. If substance abuse is on the radar screen at all, ask, do you work with substance abuse at all? Mm -hmm. If they say no, and that's a big issue in your life, Find somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, Chris, let me, let me ask you this. So, you know, like <clears throat> earlier you mentioned Alcoholics Anonymous. So if I'm in, if I'm in the throes of addiction and I want to get treatment, you know, is it, better to, is it better to see a therapist or start an AA program or both? Or, I mean, what, what is somebody who's in addiction that wants help do? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, and, and I'm glad you ask it that way because one of the phrases I wanted to, say today is that very early on in my life before my career even began there was a guy that made a statement that really stuck with me and he was just a waiter looking back on it dude probably had alcoholism i, I have no idea but uh, he made the statement that what works best for most is alcoholics anonymous mm. um it's not for everybody, but it is. I find that to be generally true. What works best for most is Alcoholics Anonymous. However, no, that's, uh, you, you get a therapist that works with substance abuse. There's detox programs. Mm -hmm. There's intensive outpatient programs. You, you might just need to slam dunk into a rehab facility right from the get-go. And, and, and for people that are pretty progressed in their uh, troubles with substances or gambling or eating or sexual addictions, then rehabs are, are the first step. Mm -hmm. You know, you've heard of Interventions. Uh, oh, yeah. A book by, uh, autobiography of Steven Tyler from Aerosmith. Love Steven Tyler, man. Oh, yeah. He's he, awesome. <laughs> he went, I mean, his band and, his, and his, his, his group got together and said, dude, we're not talking to you. We're not dealing with you. We're not going on tour. We're not doing anything. We're done with you if you don't go to rehab right now. And that's the basis of an intervention. So it really is a, a complicated score on what's the first step. Mm -hmm. What works best for most is Alcoholics Anonymous, but there are, there's lots of ways to take that first step. Mm -hmm. It's just important that you reach out and do it. Yeah, it's important to do something, right? Yeah, Before I think... it's too late. I'm going to have to pull... Man, I, I have so much more that we're going to talk about. This time just blew by. Uh, this is a fun way of looking at a concept maybe that we can try to attack um, with the concept of denial. And maybe it's all we can get into such a short show that helps identify why people miss this so much in their own lives. Uh, I have done this with many, many people. Let me be clear with these directions. And I do not want you to go further because I use this with my people all the time and clients might be listening to this. All right, so I'm, I'm only going to do the first part that I do with people. And I'm going to put you in a state of denial right now. Okay. This is why people miss what's going on in their own lives with what seems to be so obvious to people around them. Third marriage, DUIs, blacking out, all kinds of stuff going on. And they're like, no, I don't have a problem. I, I, it's, I'm, I'm cool. I'm good. I'm straight. That's what we call a state of denial, and I'm going to put you in right now. Okay. All right? So all I want you to do is I want you to take this sheet of paper, read through the piece of paper, and count the number of Fs on this page. Okay? As I'm reading? Just count the number of Fs, read it through once, and see if you can see how many Fs are on the page. Feature films are the result of years of scientific study combined with the experience of years. He's looking and reading, guys, and he's going to focus for a second. I think I see three Fs, or four, if I look at the title of the document. 
All right. Put that out. All right. So that's count the Fs. And you gave one of the tips away. So if future clients are learning, yeah, you got to look at the title. The directions are, you know, read it through the page. Count the number of Fs on the page. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is there are more than four Fs on that page. Really? Uh, I can't go further with you because, you know, it, it's not a trick. After the show is off, I will, I will show that to you and help you to see what you missed. It's no trick. It's black and white. The words you started to read, it's a small little paragraph for the audience. It's about six, seven lines of, of text. It's written, and, and it's, not, it's not a trick. Okay. But, but you couldn't follow the simple directions, not from intelligence or not from anything other than the way your eyes and brain and body works, pe- nobody's ever gotten that right. Really? Never. Never. I'm interested to see what the... What, what the, you did wrong, yeah, right? I'm interested, yeah. You flat out missed it. Yeah, we can't tell the audience? No, because <laughs> then people will be like, all right, I'm going to catch him. Uh, well, I, I saw this F thing a couple years ago. I heard about it, and I'm going to get it right. I bet they wouldn't even still get it right, honestly. So what do you use that for, though? I mean, what To is- demonstrate the inability to see what is very clear. Denial is not denying that I have a problem with alcohol, drugs, sexual addictions, or food, or gambling. I I am not saying, hey, I got something going on and I'm blowing it off. That's what the word denial sounds like, but denial is much more powerful and significant in that you are unable to know that this is going on in your life. And that's why it progresses and keeps going on and on and and gets to the point where people really are in a destitute state. This, they say, progresses like the snowball rolling down the hill until it ends in jails, institutions, or death, or abstinence. Highly support an abstinence-based program for addiction. Now, unfortunately, what we're not going to get to today because of time is how do you differentiate between substance abuse and substance addiction yes we just don't have time today unfortunately that's a great question maybe part two it's gonna have to be a cliffhanger yeah yeah. i'll try super quick in early stages we see things like sneaking drinks and feeling guilty and and uh having a memory a memory blackout for the first time it moves into the second stage where you you know you get um uh, more memory blackouts, you get multiple DUIs, life starts crashing in. The biggest marker here is a loss of control, meaning, best way I can say that in a super brief way, when you lose control of your relationship with gambling, with sexual activity, with eating addictions, with any drug, with alcohol, when you lose control, it's a big marker in the second stage. Best way I thought of helping people understand this is it's completely unpredictable. What's going to happen? You might intend to go out with the boys and have four beers or hang out with the ladies and have two glasses of wine and you end up three, four glasses of wine in and you're dangerously driving. Mm-hmm. It's, it's completely unintended and completely non-planned with a non-alcoholic person. It's really clear. I could tell you pretty much how many alcohol drinks I'm going to have this week, mm-hmm. you know, give or take. An alcoholic just has zero predictability. So then in the later stages, you know, we look for things that are just a mess the chronic phase or the third stage of addiction where you know it's all the stereotypes and myths you know brown paper bag male not female uh you know unshaven unkept unemployed divorced multiple times i mean life really does get to be a wreck but one of the big points i would make here is back into the early stages the early phases when you just begin using your alcohol or it begins to progress a little bit in your 20s and 30s highly successful highly functional members of society have drug and alcohol addictions so that's a super brief quick look at like what do we what do we look for how do we determine what's going on for somebody between abuse and addiction Ironically, right now, all we call it, we, we have this crazy diagnostic system, I feel like, in some ways, and this is one big one. All we diagnose is substance use disorder. That's what it's called now. And I don't like that because it cl- clumps everyone all together in. Some of what I just rattled off in super quick fashion really relates to addiction characteristics. But there are people that come in, they're busted on the job because they got alcohol on there. Yeah. On their breath. Yeah, yeah. From the night before, 
blowing only a blood alcohol of like 0.4 or whatever, really low, but it's because they, and they get in trouble. Well, or, or maybe you catch a DUI. That's not cool. Yeah. There's an abuse of substances that is not any, it's not addiction. Right. You have to meet so many markers. That's interesting. Yeah. To that's hear the that only, kind of thing. Yeah. I wish we could have a blood test. And I feel like in years to come, as science grows, I'll be able to jerk blood out of your arm and tell you, you've got this gene. You've got this blood marker. So there's something you think that could be testable in the future to see if you have addictive tendencies. Way in the future. Not tendencies. Addiction. Addiction. Interesting. We all have tendencies. Yeah. It's funny you say uh, that there's addictive personalities or. Ad- or addiction is a is a is a biomarker, a gene, or whatever. Because I have seen people who've gone through recovery programs and recover from drug and alcohol addiction who were addicted to other things after that. Right. Sex. Golf, Absolutely. I mean, you know what? That's it is. something it's called really, cross addiction. Yeah. Yeah. I got a, a a friend who wouldn't mind me saying this, but you know he struggled with drug addiction. He went through Alcoholics Anonymous. He got cleaned up. You know, but then he became addicted to, um, I mean, different things. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if he was addicted, but he, he went all in with everything that he did. I There's mean, a personality-based no... intensity, which isn't addiction. I mean, people say, I have addictive personality. No, I, I, don't, I don't know really what that is. Uh, I've said thousands of times, you don't get addicted to picking your nails. You don't get addicted to football. You don't get addicted to cars. You don't get addicted to fish. I like fish. I'm not addicted to fish. Only addiction that we know of is alcohol, drugs, gambling, sex, and food. And actually, there is a fourth process addiction that's, that's interestingly possible. The World Health Organization, I do understand, recently uh, uh, accredited online gaming addictions. That yeah, is okay. possibly a yeah, thing. Yeah. Right, but, yeah. But sure that, but there are people that play video games for 18 hours. I'm not talking about your teenage kid who just likes playing video games. 18 hours a day, every day. Can you imagine? Yeah, sounds, that's, like, sounds like addiction. Maybe, that's right? the type of thing we're talking about. We're not talking about how people talk about addiction in, in, in today's vernacular, in our, in our psychobabble world, which I kind of love. <laughs> You're right. You can only get, addiction is different than an addictive personality or an intense person or whatnot. Um, I don't know. I think we did okay, Craig, to kind of hit some of the main points. But, yeah, this is, as you can tell, I mean, I'm trying to talk fast. Yeah. I mean, you know, addiction, addiction is a huge topic, man. We could have multiple shows we will. Over, over multiple, you know, months and maybe even years talking about This was intended to topic. be a broader scope with some, some therapy world observations that i have yeah it, this is an overview yeah and a really quick one absolutely that's, that's yeah we okay. could d- dive much deeper into this whole thing for sure and we're gonna wrap up uh pointing towards some of our stuff coming on now um with where are we going i decided not too long ago actually in session kind of made a decision we need to do a marriage model um, uh, there's something called emotion focused therapy that I find to be by far the biggest influencer in my brain working with marriage couples and attachment issues. And I've, I've, I've only kind of come really hip to it in the last three, four years. So we're going to definitely talk about marriage and emotion-focused therapy. And I've got a couple guests lined up. I think we've got uh, a, a guy named Adrian locked in for uh, computer technology anxiety. Yes. Yeah. That's going to be yeah. a good one. That's going to be. I'm looking <laughs> we, forward to that. We were one. talking about that with you. Uh, yeah, earlier today. About a half hour ago. Yeah, exactly. Guys. <laughs> Take us out of here, sir. Okay, guys. We appreciate you listening. If you're a first time listener, welcome. If you're a repeat listener, we do appreciate it. If you guys are enjoying our show, we would appreciate it if you would leave us a review and also subscribe. Our goal is to bring awareness to these issues that we're talking about and reviews and subscriptions will help us rank in the search windows. And so that helps us get the word out to uh, other potential listeners. Uh, You can follow us on social media by going to throughatherapisteyes.com and finding links to our Facebook and our Instagram on there. And uh, we, like we said earlier, we do welcome comments and questions. We'd like to do some shows where we just answer listener questions. And again, if you're kind of leery about asking a 
mental health or an emotional type question on Facebook or, or one of those places, then just uh, send us a uh, Facebook messenger and we will keep your name uh, confidential. I see a day and time to come when people are just loading up comments and thoughts and questions without shame. Yeah. Yeah. We need to get, uh, you know, if, if you have a question, chances are you're not the only one with the question. Guaranteed. And asking that question and getting it answered will help not only you, but perhaps a lot of other people. So we would uh, love to love to hear from you. Dialogue. All right, man. Anything else? Sorry, we ran a little bit long today. I think a couple minutes over our normal thing, but uh, it, there's a reason for it. Yeah, definitely. All right, thanks, Craig. All right, Appreciate man. it. You guys have a great weekend.